I'm very happy uh, this evening to be able to introduce Dr. Sarah Maxwell. She is a research biologist at the Klamath Bird Observatory in Jackson County in Southern Oregon. And I'll say it so she won't have to. Klamath Bird Observatory is the only independent bird research organization in the state of Oregon. Uh, they do research all over southwestern Oregon and the northern tier of counties in California. Uh, their, their area is the Klamath Siskiyou bioregion. Uh, they've been operating there for more than 20 years. Uh, Sarah herself has been there more than a few weeks. Um, in fact, I was still living in Ashland when she first appeared on the scene. Uh, and she has been involved in a number of different research projects, but the reason she's talking to us tonight is because she is directly involved in KBO's use of MODIS stations. Uh, they have two in Jackson County. Uh, there are two now underway at Malher. There's one at Bandon. Uh, they're constructing one or two in Eugene, but when we get ours online at Ankeny, it will be the only one in the Willamette Valley between Eugene and the state of Washington. So Sarah here is to tell us about what they're able to do and what they're hoping to do. Uh, and this will be a real education for those of us who are modus virgins. Sarah. Thank you, Harry. Let me get my screen going here. Okay, thanks so much for coming everybody. I'm really excited to be here this evening to talk to you about our ongoing research with Oregon Vesper Sparrow, including uh, some of the MODIS work we're doing. Uh, one of our region's unique and at risk birds. And Harry mentioned KBO a little bit, but just a brief introduction. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization our mission is to advance bird and habitat conservation through science, education, and partnerships. And we do focus on the Klamath-Siskiyou bioregion where most of our studies are, but through Avian Knowledge Northwest, which is a, an online data center, we also work throughout the Pacific Northwest and we have some international capacity building programs um, to kind of cover the ranges of our shared migratory birds recognizing that birds also connect people across continents by the nature of their migratory journeys. Um, but today I'm gonna to focus on the Oregon Vesper Sparrow, which is a prime example of a little brown job, which is what birders uh, sometimes call small, hard to identify brown birds that we occasionally all struggle with identifying. Um, I think this particular one is very charming. They are excellent singers and their name Vesper Sparrow comes from the fact that they also like to sing at dusk, um, not just in the morning. Um, so that's a, a common sound if you're in a open habitat, grasslands, meadows, sagebrush steppe, um, and that's where you're going to find this species. So the Vesper Sparrow species as a whole is widespread across North America. So the pink color in the map um, shows its breeding range and you can see it covers a lot in Northern US and Canada. Um, but our Oregon subspecies is actually unique to the Pacific Northwest and there's some subtle differences between it and the other um, types of Vesper Sparrows. And this one breeds only in Oregon and Washington currently. And it is considered a species of conservation concern. So breeding bird survey data have been showing ongoing declines of about 5% a year, uh, which doesn't sound like too much, but that's equivalent to losing over 90% of their population since 1968 when the breeding bird survey started. And we've observed a lot of um, local extirpations. So while they used to breed in British Columbia and Northern California, they no longer do. And a lot of their um, former kind of nesting range in Washington has been reduced. And we currently estimate the population is only two to 3,000 individuals. And for these reasons, um, the Oregon subspecies is currently under review for listing as um, threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. 
So at Klamath Bird Observatory, we're contributing to a range-wide study uh, to help determine the causes of this decline and see what we can do about it. So in 2018, we started an in-depth study of Vesper Sparrow productivity by finding and monitoring nests, uh, looking at survivorship by banding birds with these unique combinations of color bands and tracking them over time, and also their habitat needs. So doing some vegetation surveys in areas where we find nests and comparing them to areas where we don't find nests um, to try to get at those kind of specific uh, habitat needs. Because without knowing what's causing the decline, we don't know how to help. So we need to pinpoint uh, what we call limiting factors before we can come up with appropriate conservation actions that help you know, alleviate whatever factors those might be. And this is always complicated for a migratory bird because they live in so many different areas throughout the year. So it gets hard to disentangle whether the problems are resulting from something going on in the breeding grounds, during migration and stopover sites, or on the wintering grounds. Okay, I mentioned um, looking at productivity. And so to study this and nest success, first you have to find nests and a lot of nests, um, which can be really challenging, but it's actually one of my favorite things I get to do as a biologist. It's, it's a really fun challenge. And I think at first I thought these birds would have very few places to hide in these open meadow habitats that they like, but they spend so much time on the ground, they can hide in grass that's, you know, three inches tall and you'll never see them. So this, while harder than my thought, um, like I said, ended up being one of my favorite things. You have to get really sneaky and, uh, you know, try to follow the birds to their nests, but not follow them too close so that you're disturbing them or um, changing their behavior because they see you as a, as a predator. They don't want you to find their nest. Um, and so it's something you have to get kind of good at, kind of tricky at. And they are very well camouflaged. If you have noticed, there is a female sitting on a nest in this photo, um, incubating a, a clutch of eggs. So this is a typical nest site on the ground and kind of tucked into the side of a, of a clump of grass. So nests on the ground do seem very vulnerable. Um, here's another photo of a nest with four eggs. And our studies uh, in the Rogue Basin area show that the percentage of successful nests is between about 55 and 80% per year. So we've seen a wide range of variability, but all of those numbers are normal and even quite high for a ground nesting bird. Um, where you might only expect about half of the nests to survive in a given year. And when the nests do fail, it's typically due to predators. So, you know, almost anything out in these meadows will eat bird eggs and nestlings if they can find them. So, you know, snakes, rodents, jays and crows, even coyotes or deer. Um, there's quite a few sandhill cranes out in these meadows, and I, I suspect they, they find a nest once in a while. Uh, to snack on. And we do see some occasional nest abandonments due to weather. Um, so for instance, this year we had a really late hail storm in June. Um, our, our study site is on a higher elevation mountain meadow. And a lot of the females just decided they couldn't, you know, they didn't have enough energy to not forage and sit on the nest and um, had to leave their nests and try again. So it's something we've wondered about uh, with our high elevation site compared to, for instance, the Willamette Valley, is whether birds are choosing that kind of trade-off where nest success is pretty high at this high elevation meadow, but then the trade-off is occasionally um, you have an unfortunate weather event that causes a lot of nest failure. Um, so that's, that's something we're kind of wondering about is a, a difference between our study site and lower elevation. Um, so here's kind of a map of uh, the meadow we work in up on Howard Prairie outside of Ashland. And all of those dots represent um, various nests we've found. We've tracked over 100 nests over the three years of our study. And like I said, so far, nest success seems to be uh, quite good. 
So if poor reproduction isn't the cause of the subspecies decline, then what is? Um, and we're thinking about things like invasion with exotic grasses into meadows. Um, is there poor fledgling survival? Could increases in pesticide use be affecting either birds' health directly or the health of the insect populations that they depend on? Uh, and so the goal of our study is to kind of start narrowing down these possible causes and start developing uh, a conservation strategy. So we're also, as I mentioned, looking at survival. We've banded 77 adults and 135 nestlings, and they all get these um, pretty bracelets, different colors, and each combination is unique so that we can identify individuals just by using binoculars. And reciting efforts where we go out and look for banded birds have taken place every year to kind of keep track of how many of the banded birds survive and return to the site year after year. Um, our adult return rate has been about 58%, and our juvenile return rate has actually been less than 10%. So that's something we're finding interesting. Um, those results are notably different than Oregon Vesper Sparrow populations in the Willamette Valley, where some of our um, partners are working. Uh, they find juvenile return rates to be quite a bit higher, more in the range of 40%. So that's a question we want to understand more. Um, where are our juveniles going? Are they simply more likely to move away um, from our main meadow and, you know, nest somewhere else the following year where we don't find them again? Or are they actually experiencing higher mortality either right after fledging or during their first um, migration in winter? And as I mentioned, disentangling those causes is tough for a migratory species because of the different um, geographies that they occupy throughout their annual cycle. And so this is kind of a, a buzzword in ornithology right now is full annual life cycle conservation and thinking about not only what do birds need here um, where they're nesting and where we can study them very carefully, but also what are those uh, habitat requirements or potential threats they're facing at their over, um, over migration stopover sites and also where they spend the winter. And so our study birds are probably down in central or southern California right now, but nobody knows until very recently, and only for a few individuals, but um, exactly where the Oregon Vesper Sparrow subspecies goes. Um, because they do mix with other subspecies of Vesper sparrows on the wintering grounds. So, and they're not visually distinguishable. So it's not as simple as, um, you know, going to eBird or, you know, somewhere where people are, are recording observations, because if they're finding a Vesper sparrow, you have no way of knowing if it's Oregon subspecies or if it's a bird from the Great Basin or somewhere else. Um, and it's actually important to pinpoint this and have a pretty precise idea of where migratory stopover and wintering ground locations are um, to help us understand what threats they might be facing in, in those parts of the annual cycle. So this is where we, we enter um, some of this new technology that we've started to deploy, including miniaturized GPS tags and the MODIS wildlife tracking network. Um, so these are some new tools we can use to shed light on these questions um, and some others too in the, in the case of MODIS that I'll get into. So to be light enough to put on a small songbird, um, they can only be archival, so they can't actually send any GPS information to us like in a you know, live kind of way. Um, we have to recapture those birds after a round trip migration to get the GPS tags and our data back. Um, and here's a photo of one of our tagged males and you can see, hopefully you can see, there's a GPS antenna um, sticking off the end of his back. And yeah, so all you can do is put these tags out and, and hope you get a bunch of birds flying back with your tags and your data that you can then recapture. Um, another really interesting 
thing for me in learning how to do this was that the GPS tags have to be programmed. So with limited size, limited battery, and limited space, um, storage space, you have to tell the tags when you want them to take um, a fix, like look for satellites and take a GPS location. Um, they can only store about 80 locations. And so, yeah, we, we think about that very carefully ahead of time and um, try to put more fixes during migratory periods or what we think are going to be the migratory periods when the birds are probably on the move and fewer fixes when we think they're probably fairly stationary after they reach their wintering site. Um, and so there, those are things you have to tell the tags um, what you want them to do. And then we also have to make these leg loop harnesses to put them on the birds. So um, those loops you see there, each one goes around a bird's leg and the tag then sits on the bird's back. Uh, we actually use stretch magic, which is a type of jewelry cord. Um, but there's a few different materials that various research um, projects use. This is just the one we've, we've found has worked for us. And at this point, you may be wondering, how do we catch one of these birds to put that GPS tag on him? Um, so here are a couple of us research team heading out in the field with our poles. Um, we have mist nets, which are these really fine um, mesh nets that we put up between poles. And they're hard to see. The birds don't see them that well. And we put a playback speaker under the net and we'll start playing a Oregon Vesper Sparrow song. And this usually makes the resident male kind of mad. He sees it as an invading male encroaching on his territory. He kind of wants to go check him out or chase him away. Um, and so he'll come in towards that song um, and hopefully get caught in the net. So here's some photos um, of us capturing birds and putting out the GPS tags. Um, that one in the top left is us extracting a bird from a net, and you can see what I mean by it's fine and hard to see. It's not probably not showing up too well for you in that picture, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm grabbing a bird out of the net there. Um, and then applying those color bands like I talked about so we can identify one individual from another. Um, and then there's our GPS tag with the leg loop harnesses. And in the bottom right photo, you can see the GPS tag sitting on the bird's back after we, we have that backpack type arrangement on. Um, so we captured 10 males in 2020 um, and put out these GPS tags. And we're really excited that we got four of them back this year. So um, that means four males that came back to our study site. And we were able to recapture all of them. Um, and unfortunately, one tag didn't seem to work, but this isn't terribly surprising. Um, it is relatively new technology, and a lot of the studies that come out um, have relatively small sample sizes. But, you know, nevertheless, it's, it's really started to revolutionize our understanding of bird migration patterns um, across a lot of different species. So if, if you don't know any precise data, ahead of time, then a few precise data points are really cool and really important. Um, so yeah, on the left, there's a, a tag after we took it off a bird. Now it's a little more beat up and worse for the wear, but um, yeah, so we have data, these unique GPS locations that just no one else has done before. This is the first time this subspecies has been tracked this way. Um, so on the right is the map of the three, or maybe I should say two and a half individuals that we had good data for. Um, the guy represented in pink starts out kind of slow on his fall migration. It's so interesting, like he stops over in a several different places, stays for a day or three days. Um, and unfortunately, his tags seem to stop working in mid-October, so we don't know exactly where he ended up. Um, but then we have this guy represented in green who seems to do what we're calling maybe a false start migration. Um, he kind of bops out towards lava beds for a day and then back to our study site, stays just a couple more days and then starts on his fall migration. So that's something we weren't expecting. Um, 
didn't really know that they did, but possibly it's because, you know, this technology is new and no one's been able to look um, with this much detail at what, what these birds are doing. Um, and then after that, he goes pretty fast. So he has basically that one stopover on September 25th. And then after that, he's more or less on his wintering grounds a little bit northeast of Fresno um, in California. And then we have the blue, the guy represented by blue dots and arrows. Um, and he has a totally different strategy. He flies about halfway and then hangs out for like two weeks um, before continuing on and then choosing a wintering site further south, a little bit south of Fresno. And so even with just these two and a half examples, we're seeing a range of behaviors and different strategies, different locations. Um, and that makes us really excited to continue to see more um, about what these birds are doing. Um, oh, and I should mention the red dot and the orange dot are not GPS tag birds. Those are actually um, records from eBird where folks saw a flock of Vesper sparrows and noticed one was banded and was able to take a photo. Um, and so those birds came from, one is from the Puget Sound and one is from the Willamette Valley. So I put those records on there too, just to, I think it's pretty interesting. They're even a little further west. Um, and yeah, we'll have to see if that pattern holds for these, the birds from the, across the range, the breeding range of Oregon Vesper sparrow. Yeah, so the GPS tags were one exciting kind of new technology um, that we've been applying. And then the other big one is the MODIS network. So in 2020, we installed the first MODIS station in Oregon at the Vesper Meadow Restoration Preserve. And we do now have a second one at the Rogue River Preserve and, and more are popping up all over Oregon. Um, so the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System is a collaborative research network, and it uses automated radio telemetry arrays to study the movements of small organisms. So these tags, they're even smaller than the GPS tags. Um, let's see, our GPS tags weigh about a gram. Um, some of these are, you know, less than half that if you, depending on how long you want it to last, uh, they are even small enough to be carried by uh, some insects, so butterflies and bees. Um, but researchers are primarily using them on birds and bats right now. Um, the MODIS tags emit a radio frequency that has an individually coded ID that can be detected by a nearby MODIS station anywhere in the world. So our MODIS station will provide location data for other research projects if their um, tagged animals happen to pass by our stations and anyone else's station will be able to pick up on our tagged birds if they happen to fly near enough um, to a different station. So this map is showing the current um, up and running MODIS stations in the US. And the East Coast has a really well-established MODIS network. Um, it's led to some really exciting new discoveries in animal migration. And I've been wishing that I had taken a series of screenshots from this MODIS page on the West Coast because there are more stations in the West every time I look at this map, um, just in the last year or two, um, it's really been exploding. So we're excited to kind of be on this forefront. And now, now you will be too, um, of helping develop this MODIS network in the Western US. So the automated reciting ability and location estimation from MODIS technology is going to help us study um, habitat use, movements, and survival, um, we hope, of the young Vesper sparrows. And again, we're particularly interested in that vulnerable post-fledging period. It's when most songbirds experience the most mortality, and like I was saying before, um, we've noticed low juvenile return rates at our study site, and we're you know, still trying to figure out why. Um, we also think this is going to help us explore whether or not they're simply dispersing to other meadows, um, because now they have, well, not all of them, but this past summer we put MODIS compatible life tags on 12 Oregon Vesper Sparrow nestlings. 
um, that we're about ready to fledge. So about as big as they can get, as big as they can be before they fledge, um, when you can still um, grab them from the nest. And those life tags are solar powered and they emit a signal every few minutes um, during daylight hours when the sun's out for, we expect the lifetime of the bird. And um, with our partner at Vesper Meadow Education um, Program, we set up an array of 18 modus nodes around the edge of the meadow. So there is a main modus station on, um, on the building at Vesper Meadow, but this node network is supplementing that. And so the, the modus station needs line of sight to detect tags. And some of the areas of the meadow here were either kind of behind a ridge with a tree line or you know, some other kind of obstacle that's blocking that line of sight. So one reason for the node network was to pick up these edges of the meadow that aren't being um, seen by the main station. And another reason is we are piloting the use of the node array to track more precise fledgling locations um, via triangulation. So the idea is if a tagged bird hits off multiple nodes at the same time, you can use those data to estimate fairly precisely where it is. Um, and this is super useful for a grassland fledgling bird like this because they spend all their time hidden, they're deep in the grass. It's a really hard period right after they fledge to find them, um, to kind of observe what they're doing visually. So we're excited about the possibilities of the, the network um, of these nodes to kind of do some of that um, for us without us having to be there, um, disturbing the birds and or maybe just not being able to find them. Um, so yeah, the node on the right, there's a picture of us setting them up. They're pretty small, about the size of a hand maybe. Um, and we put them up on these eight foot poles. Um, they are also solar powered. So we had a very interesting problem with some of them becoming favorite perches for meadowlarks and other birds that are up there. Um, I had to drive up there about once every week or two and clean some bird poop off some of these nodes. Um, but it's really interesting. And then the, the bottom left just kind of shows the inside of it. Um, it's kind of battery source, data storage, all, all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, the node network is an interesting supplement to, to our main, main modus station up there. And hopefully getting at some slightly different questions than we could with just, just one station. Um, so in the upper left there, that's a picture of the MODIS life tag. So it has a teeny little solar panel um, that powers it, um, an antenna, and then we're using the same style of leg loop harness to um, put those on birds. And we also have a handheld telemetry unit as an additional supplement. Um, so that we can take anywhere. So maybe not at Vesper Meadow, is it, you know, way outside of our node network and main modus station. And um, we want to be able to more easily find the fledglings that might be dispersing to other meadows. So next spring, we'll go out with this handheld antenna and see if we can find, you know, how many of those 12 can we find um, if they're not staying at Vesper Meadow. Um, there's a lot of other smaller meadows around. Some of them are difficult to access. Either they're on private property or there's some other reason. Um, also just an effort situation. So it takes a lot more time to survey the meadows to see birds individually. Um, but yeah, with the antenna, we should be able to just pick up the beeping tags if we are uh, close enough. And these have a range of you know, it could be 100 or 200 meters in open habitat like this without any obstacles. So um, this is something else that we think is going to help us determine whether those low juvenile return rates we um, have been observing is because they're moving to other meadows or because they're actually uh, experiencing high mortality rates during their first weeks or year um, of life. And in addition to enhancing our own Vesper Sparrow research, our MODIS stations in Southern Oregon have actually detected several birds from other research studies, which is 
super fun and exciting. Um, we've detected two Lewis's woodpeckers that originated or were tagged um, in Montana. And these are the only ones that have been detected so far outside of Montana. So the researchers there suspected they um, migrated more or less Southwest um, for the winter, but they didn't know exactly where and they didn't actually really expect them to fly over Southern Oregon. So um, that's been really interesting. They're popped up somewhere those um, researchers didn't expect. And we've also had a hit on a Swainson's thrush that was tagged in British Columbia, um, kind of inland, and then also a semi-palmated plover and a western sandpiper that were tagged, um, well, one in Vancouver and one kind of near Victoria um, or on Vancouver Island. So yeah, our, our station is assisting other researchers with their migration tracking projects. Um, and that's an advantage of building up the network in general is that everyone's um, tagged animals are gonna have a better chance of getting hits if, uh, if there's more stations just out there on the landscape. And I guess I just wanted to mention too, I, just because those arrows end in Southern Oregon doesn't necessarily mean those birds stopped there. Like they're not all overwintering at Vesper Meadow. Um, they were basically tagged once by the station and then continued on migration. Um, so yeah, so that's indicating their migratory path, but not necessarily where they then stopped or spent the winter. So just a few examples from some other studies. Sorry, this is a super boring slide. Don't feel like you need to try to read all that. Um, but there's been at least 150 papers now come out um, published in, you know, research journals using MODIS data. Um, a lot of them have to do with stopover duration. So how long do they stay at a migratory stopover site? When do they leave a breeding site or leave a, a migratory stopover site? Um, a lot of the papers are kind of along those lines. Uh, for some bird species that move between kind of predictable discrete habitat spots, so you know, potentially shorebirds that need these kind of wet inland sites. Um, you can do some tracking of movements between patches. I think folks are thinking about, you know, if, during years of drought and certain um, typical shorebird spots dry up, like where do those individuals go? So those kind of movement dynamics. Um, and one of my favorite examples, I'm definitely biased because I studied Kirtland's warblers for my dissertation, but um, they also nest in kind of really limited discrete habitat patches such that a network of MODIS stations can cover most of the suitable habitat in Michigan. And some researchers put a lot of MODIS tags on adults and they found that 11% of the breeding birds and 60% of the non-breeding individuals made these movements of uh, I think the range was something like five up to 80 kilometers during the breeding season. So while a lot of other birds are just staying on their territories, there's like a surprisingly high, high percentage of birds that are just off wandering around um, the rest of Michigan. And again, something that no one really expected. And we're only now have the kind of technology available to um, see this kind of detail in these birds' lives. And those researchers suspect they might be prospecting for habitat, so kind of scouting out places where they might think about nesting the following year. Um, and it's just possible a lot of birds are doing things like this that we don't know about because this type of technology is so new. Um, so yeah, so it's it's exciting to be to be a part of. Um, if you want to hear more from KBO, that's kind of most of what I had about our Vesper Sparrows and Modus and, um, and our study here. But uh, if you want to continue to get updates on our Vesper Sparrow research or our other projects, uh, you can sign up for our blog on our website uh, using that subscribe button at klamathbird.org. And 
I kind of just want to quickly thank everyone who has made this work possible. So we have a lot of funders, um, a lot of staff and interns, folks at KBO, as well as um, partners at other organizations. So Bob Altman and Gary Slater are leading the other pieces of the range-wide Best for Sparrow research, Bob Altman in the Willamette and Gary Slater in um, the Puget Lowlands in Washington. Um, MPG Ranch are the folks that are tagging the Lewis's woodpeckers and they were extremely instrumental in helping us put up our MODA stations because there's certainly a learning curve um, to doing that. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening. And I think with that, we can kind of see if there's any questions. And let me know if I should stop my screen share or just leave this up while we um, see if anyone has something to ask. I'll go ahead and stop it, sir. And we gotta get the uh, questions up here. Harry, I think you're muted. Okay, uh, you can use either chat or Q and A if you want to do questions. Kathy Patterson will be handling, will be moderating the questions. Uh, the MPG Ranch that Sarah mentioned is also consulting with us on the placement of the and the construction of the Moda Station at Ankeny. Uh, and it's very exciting to be on the cutting edge of this kind of technology that gives it so much more data than just the sort of randomness of bird banding, which was a good move, but it didn't give us enough data. This gives us sometimes 24 by 7 data on a bird for days or even months if we're lucky. Anyway, I'm going to turn it over now to Kathy, who's going to handle the questions for you. Can, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Because okay. my picture is not on the screen. I know I can change that. Okay. One moment. There you go. Well, we already have a few questions. Sarah, um, again, we're probably going to have quite a few questions, but I just thought your presentation was fantastic. I didn't know anything about MODIS before um, you started your talk tonight. And I'm a member of Plymouth Bird Observatory. Uh, mm -hmm. So their website is very good. And I wish I could go on a lot of the field trips that are offered. <laughs> it's a bit of a drive yeah. down, uh, to Medford and Plymouth Falls. But we do have a question coming in from uh, Dr. David Quay Craig. And he's asking, how quickly do you get data from other stations about detection of a bird? Um, you can get it pretty much instantly. Uh, there's no alert necessarily, but if you, you manage your MODIS uh, tags and stations through a, a website on modis.org, and so you can go and check, you know, anytime you want. Um, and well, I guess I shouldn't say you don't get alerts. I'm not sure. None of our birds have been detected by any other stations yet. So I'm not sure if it's going to, you know, send me uh, some kind of notice or if it's going to be me kind of just checking that page once in a while. Um, but yeah, they will pop up on your MODIS webpage, like your kind of control board uh, right away. Yeah. Thank you. We mm -hmm. have another question, question from Alexa. And she's asking, do you think you might recover any more of your tags off captured birds? Mm, yeah, um, if you're referring to the GPS tags, I think there is a chance. We've had, a hand, not a large percentage, but a handful of birds that we haven't seen. Like say we banned them one year and we didn't see them the next year. And then we did then see them the following year. Um, so I think there's certainly a chance um, that some of the guys that we didn't find this summer might return next year uh, somewhere where we can find them. And especially if we spend a little more time going to some of these kind of what we call satellite meadows, smaller meadows around our main study site. Um, I mean, there's always a chance one of them could have moved um, to one of those smaller meadows as well. So I, I don't know the chances are high, but there's definitely... Uh, a non-zero probability. 
it, then uh, Christine Mack is asking, uh, are there any concerns about hacking or vandalism of, you know, particularly when you have the um, modem, modus in the, you know, meadows that you're working? Yeah, so there could be. So with our main stations, we're lucky in that one is at a, a private residence. So, um, you know, there's just someone there all the time and it's very unlikely, I think, that someone would come bother that house. Uh, Michael Babbitt is asking, what is the conservation status of the species Preserve. generally? Um, maybe not the Oregon Vesper Sparrow, but um, internationally? So the national status is not of concern. Um, or something like that. So it's really the, the local subspecies that's um, at risk. The first part of that question. I mean, someone is asking that. Yeah, because it, it's, um, I don't have the person asking this question, but um, they're interested in hosting a MODIS station on our <laughs> conservation easement. And then, can you give an estimate of the cost involved to get it set up? And did Harry say that you do consulting? <laughs> Um, we're not really doing consulting on MODIS stations, mostly because we are also new to it and so are not the most efficient people to be helping put up new stations. Um, the cost, boy, I don't have a good one off the top of my head, but it's certainly a couple thousand dollars of equipment and then plus whatever, you know, staff time, um, you know, needed to get it up. So. They're not super cheap, I wouldn't, but um, yeah, I don't have a, a more precise estimate like on the top of my head. I would, yeah, I, can I interrupt, Kathy? Oh yeah, Harry yeah. might've done yeah. this more recently. Yeah, this is Harry Fuller. I did a lot of research before I did the grant uh, application. Uh, it'll be somewhere in the few thousand dollars, depending on whether there's electricity and whether there's internet, both of which eventually become important for where the station is. Uh, the guys at MPG and the people at Birds Canada are the best sources of good information. But if this person uh, is curious, uh, tell him to get a hold of Salem Audubon and get my email and I'll be happy to talk to him on the phone and run down all the research I did on how do you do this, where you do it, what's it cost, how did it, you know, all that stuff. I'll be able to give him a 15 minute summary and then he'll know how to proceed. And we may be able to help him. If he's in the Willamette Valley, Salem Audubon can help him get this done. So there's a second part to that question. And then did Harry say that you do consulting? Um, no, she doesn't, but the people at MPG does do. And I talked to the guy there, William Blake is his name. I think I talked to him four times on the phone just to help me get the application filled out. And there's also a lady, a biologist at Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, who uh, helps work on the wildlife refuges. And she's in Portland and she's already done three stations and she's in charge of the physical part of what we're gonna do at Ankeny. And she would also be able to help if you're somewhere in the area. Thank you, I see this slide right here. We can move up. Okay, there we go. I think that's it. And maybe you can even use this okay. to do it. Okay, there you go. So you can use these arrows. <laughs> What's happening? Just a minute. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Technical. <laughs> <laughs> technical, technical. I mean, I had the question up a minute, then it oh. moved up yeah. too much. And now okay. I can't see the next question. Kathy, I can actually see them if that would be helpful, the question. <laughs> You can. You yeah, I can see the chat. It might, too. It might, it might be very good. It um, might be very um, good. I'm also going to go to the question and answer um, tab as well. But we do have a question um, about the Polk Soil and Water Conservation District is interested in hosting a motor station. Oh, that was the person, that was the organization that asked that last question, which I didn't see the first part of that. And oh, then, okay. um, do you expect MODIS technology will replace field 
readable bands, or do you expect many of the birds will still be color banded with a smaller subset of life tags? Yeah, that's a good question. I think they have, you know, different pluses and minuses. Um, Modus is certainly, you know, at this point more expensive than color bands. Um, and for, there might be other reasons you want to color band birds. So for instance, in our nesting study, it's useful to know what individuals like a nest belongs to. And so then you might want those other identifying marks. Um, so you can track how many nests, for instance, a certain male or female has over the breeding season. Um, but yeah, the, and then, yeah, I guess it depends too, if you have the capacity to put up a modus station at your field site. So, um, as we were just mentioning, there's some expense involved with that too. Um, yeah. And then the real advantage is probably we're a little bit ahead of, uh, the curve on this, on the advantages, but once a robust, uh, network is in place, it just increases so much your chances of detecting the birds, um, away from your, wherever you're doing the tagging. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it'll ever completely replace field readable bands. And so the ongoing costs of running the MODIS station include electric, electricity and internet. Um, is there a subscription for the app or anything like that? Uh, good question. So there is no subscription if you put up a station. Um, there are fees once you start putting out tags, because um, that's when they, the MODIS folks then start to need to put, you know, effort and staff time into kind of compiling data and making it available to, to all the researchers. So um, once you're tagging birds, then there's fees associated with those to be registered in the system. Thank you. Um, and then this um, Jill is asking, I heard Nathan Pipo's presentation about MODIS stations, and she abbreviated, but I know what this stands for, the Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival, because I've been to it, the November in uh, um, 2021. And there are several types of stations, but the most extensive one is $10,000. So yeah, the, some of the costs do, costs? yeah, well, usually not that much, but the costs do vary depending on the kind of site you have available. Um, so, you know, do you need to construct the entire tower? You know, is it a, you know, a site with no existing infrastructure? Um, or is it a place that already has a building or an old telephone pole or something that you can mount it to? So, yeah, the costs definitely vary depending on the site um, where you want to put it up at. Yeah, I, I would add, because I did some research before we did, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, before we did the Enkeny site, and it was interesting when I was talking to people who got me first interested in it, I said, why don't we put one at the visitor center? It's on a hill, so it's got good line of sight in about two and a half directions, so maybe 200 degrees out of 360. It's got electricity and internet already, and it's got a parking lot, so if you got to move equipment, but if you're putting something in the wilderness and it needs solar panels, it needs a cleared area, it needs a tower built, uh, and depending on what the habitat is like, you know, building a tower on a hilltop is one thing. Putting it in the middle of a marsh is a completely different question. Putting it on a beach or on an island uh, or someplace where it's not easily accessible, it starts to multiply the costs. My suspicion is that we will be able to do Ankeny and a viewing station inside so people can see the data and a bunch of the pods around the edge for less than $7,000. That's my hope. So it really depends a lot on what's already there, how hard is it to get to, how expensive is it to put up a tower. Uh, you know, if you're putting it up on muddy soil that's wet. 365 days of the year and you got to build pillars and stuff, then that starts to add to the expense. But if you've got solid ground and all you're doing is putting up towers and you've already got electricity and internet nearby, that cuts enormous amount of cost. But if you start with solar panels, now you're talking serious money. 
Harry, I'm just curious because you yeah. mentioned Ankeny. Are yeah. the sites um, selected uh, for this the MODIS um, sites at Ankeny yet? Yeah, it's going to be on, attached to the visitors, the nature center. And it's going to be on a hilltop. I mean, the nature center is in the perfect location. The nature center were down in the valley somewhere. We'd want to put it up on the hilltop where there's no electricity and no internet. The nature center just happens to be at an enormously perfect location to put a moda station, which is why when I first heard about them, I thought, God, what a great spot. You know, it's a wildlife refuge, so there's always going to be open space. It's not going to be filled with houses. And it's on a hilltop that overlooks, you know, marsh and grassland and hillside and riparian strips. I mean, it's in a perfect location. And I didn't know at the time, but I've since learned from the people who are professionals in this area, the local federal and state biologists, mm -hmm. that it was the number one site on their list for where to put a, a motor station in the Pacific Northwest. So my sort of instinct and their studied study of this stuff, it was a perfect match. I mean, it's like some of the hilltops at Malher. You look at it and you go, God, there ought to be a motor station at Buena Vista overlooking that beautiful marsh. And this is this is one of those locations. It's just perfect in so many different ways. Another question, William is asking, uh, well, first of all, I said this is a really interesting and enjoyable presentation, and I agree with that. And then he's asking, are you or will you be making any presentations at the annual Winter Wings Festival in Klamath Falls? Oh, good question. No, I won't be going there. Um, KBO has on and off in the past uh, been at Winter Wings, but yeah, we don't have plans to be there this year. Thank you. And then David, uh, Dr. David Craig is asking, how quickly do you get data from other stations about the detection of a bird? I think we already answered that one. Okay. But I think, nope. I do want to scroll back. I think we missed one from Joan. It's pretty okay, much real you. time on the data, by the way. The data yeah. is real. It's, it's, we're talking internet here. We're talking email, uh, Facebook, Twitter, you know, once it's in the data system, there it is. It, there's no, you know, nobody's processing, editing, changing, slowing down. Oh my gosh, it's, digi it's a digital universe now when you're talking MODIS. Sorry, I see what happened. Instead of scrolling down, it went back up. Do you see that question from Joan I'm talking about? Okay. I don't see it, so go ahead. Okay, Joan asks, how much information might we be missing by only tagging males? And will we also try to tag females? Hi, Joan. <laughs> um, that's a great question, and it's a fairly common bias, actually, in a lot of ornithological studies um, that we sometimes do focus on males. Part of that is practicality with these GPS tags. So one of our top considerations is, are we going to be able to refine and recapture the bird to get our data back? And right now, male, I mean, males for us are just easier to catch via playback. Um, they're the aggressive ones, you know, that respond to the song. Um, and they're also more likely to return to the same territory um, year after year. So for practical reasons, we're focusing on males right now, but I agree. Um, there's, I don't have them on the top of my head, but there's definitely been a couple studies that have shown sometimes females have really different wintering habitats than males. Um, there can be that kind of gender segregation on the wintering grounds. And if that's true, then we are missing, um, potentially missing some important things about knowing where the females go versus the males. But um, yeah, hopefully at a future point, we'll be able to expand the study enough to include females. But yeah, right now we're just trying to maximize our recapture probability as much as we can. Okay, we do have several questions from the question and answer. Mm -hmm. um, we have, okay, some people have posted them in both. So let me just go down. Oh, um, one question from Helen is, 
which is more burdensome to the bird, a modus attachment or the bands? And then they mentioned like four at a time and I assume they mean bands. Yeah, um, well, I'd still have to say the modus attachment, uh, the bands weigh hardly anything. And even though the modus tags are light, um, I'm trying to remember exactly, they're, they're like under 3% of the bird's body weight, um, but they are, they do weigh more than the bands do. So we, yeah, we would suspect if there is any impact, the tags would have um, more so than the bands, but that's, that's one of the things we're looking at too. We'll be kind of, we'll be comparing the return rates between the tagged individuals and the untagged individuals. So we should have kind of a heads up um, about whether, if there's a big impact, I guess we'll know and we can stop doing this part of the study, but generally putting on tags that are, three, four percent of the bird's body weight is considered a low impact. Okay, I'm scrolling through these. Um, some of the questions are the same um, and people, the same people that um, wrote them in chat. And I don't see any more questions unless they're coming on your screen. Let's see, I don't see any new ones in the chat. We may have some from the audience here. And, the... and then uh, we do have our, we, this is our first um, in-person meeting for two years. <laughs> and we do have a few souls that have uh, come uh, to our meeting tonight. And you mean here. real people? So we'll turn <laughs> on the mics and we'll ask if there's anyone from the audience that might. I thought it was a two-dimensional world now. I didn't know there were three-dimensional people in <laughs> there. And see if I can get that other camera on, and then people might have questions here. I think I can do that by going here. Thank you, Thank you very much, Sarah. It was wonderful. Oh, sure. Okay, so this camera's live. <laughs> if you'd like to ask a question, any questions in the audience? Were any birds injured during the banding process? Could you hear that? I couldn't. If you could repeat it closer were to the microphone. Were any birds injured in the banding process? Oh, um, no. Our, yeah, um, we do have another program, a bird mass, like a large bird banding program. And you know, injury rates from that are, are very small and, and a program as small as ours, just tagging a, you know, 10, 20, 100 individuals. Um, yeah, we didn't have any, any injuries with that. The 